Facebook and YouTube, and we're being second, filmed. Get another pillow. I'm lifting myself up. Get another oh, pillow. Yeah. I was going to suggest that. There we go. I'll be right here. There we go. I'm Looking lifting. fantastic. There we that go. beard. I love it. The goatee. Yeah. I think mean, he's gone. I know it's like my dad at this point. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Go. Get All righty. I love the backdrop. It's perfect. Thank you. Yeah, it's kind of cool. I like it. Uh, I pretty like much there's no one who doesn't know who you are, the amount of things you've done. But before we start, Mr. Philip Locke, I interviewed you about seven years ago, and I didn't know what I was doing. And I thought you were some famous artist that made garbage from a garbage dump into art. And when I interviewed you, I interviewed you with those questions. And you were so cool. You handled it like off the cuff improv, like Robin Williams. I said to you, you take garbage from a dump and you make it into art. And you said, well, I've always been a creative person and I tried to channel my <laughs> ability. And I thought afterwards, this is the coolest guy in the world because you could have burned me and killed me so badly, justifiably. So I thank you for that. And I've always wanted to say and talk to you and say, you're an incredible person for doing that. <laughs> Very charitable. Well, I had a, um, one time I was going to an event for the Emmys many years ago and there was a TV show called, called Punked with Ashton Kutcher. And um, apparently Ashton was away doing something one weekend and Demi Moore took over the show. I didn't know, I went to this Emmy event and there's this, this Asian uh, reporter and I'm on the, the, the line, the press line with a friend of mine, Marsha Thomas, Thomason, who's a great British actress. Um, she was in Haunted Mansion with Eddie Murphy and she's just a great actress. And we were going down the line and we've been good friends forever. And the, and the reporter says to me, and I was like, uh, uh, and then the person next door goes, what's your name? And I was like, uh, Philip Locke. And then it went on like that for 20 minutes. Every question was like, and what do you do for a living? I mean, every question was like that. And then she got into, so why do you wear a hat? Do you, are you bald? And I was like, well, I have hair. I mean, there's hair under there. Like, no, I'm not bald. And then she said, well, why aren't you on queer and on queer eye for the straight guy? And I was like, well, because my agents offered me that. And she just asked me all these crazy questions. And then she's like, well, so does your girlfriend know you're gay? And I'm like, because I'm there with a girl. And I'm like, well, and I turned to Marsh and I was like, do you know I'm gay? And she's like, yeah, I know he's gay. And, and she's like, he's my friend and we're friends. It's like, it's okay. And she's, it, it just went on like that. And then finally we we're like, okay, have a nice night. We just walked away. Never knew anything. I answered every question. You're a gentleman. You just do it. Yeah, you know, I mean, you're like, okay, I don't know what anybody's problem is, but I'm just trying to get to the, the hors d'oeuvre bar <laughs> and then have some fun. You know I mean? Like, I don't like, I smoked a joint already. I'm trying to get to the hors d'oeuvres. Let's keep this moving. And so months later, months, months later, I'm in a meeting and I don't even think, I don't even think, I think we were still using pagers at the time. I mean, this was a while ago. It was punked. It was a long time ago. And, um, and all of a sudden I get all these, uh, you know, uh, whatever they we called them on pages, all these pages. And I'm like, oh, and then there's all these messages on my phone and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh my God, you're on punk and oh, you're on MTV. But I was on MTV already. I was doing house of style. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah, I'm on MTV. I know. And yeah. Anyway, people just start calling like, oh my God, you're so funny. You're this, you're that, Ashley Christian. I'm like, what are they talking about? Like, what is any of that? That's like not even me. I'm like, no, that's not even me. I'm not on punk. No, I've never even met Ashton Kutcher, blah, 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 blah. And sure enough, like it comes out what it was. Like finally people are saying like, well, you're at some press line. And then I remember it and I'm like, oh my God. So I don't, so I send, I, yeah, exactly. I'm like, thank God I was nice. And, yeah, exactly. and then I sent, so I sent Ashton Kutcher a bottle of champagne and I said, dude, I'm like, I know people talk shit about you, but I think you're great. <laughs> I know I know hate you and talk shit about you, but I think you're amazing. Thanks for the punk episode. You know, people are loving it, blah, blah. Another year passes. So it's about a year and a half, year after the whole thing happened. I'm in Sundance and I run into Demi Moore and Ashton. 
And so uh, Demi, I, I had met before, and I, who I just absolutely adore. I, I just, I love Demi more. And um, but Demi for president, I always used to say, vote for Demi for president. She just, you know, she's got it. And so I say, oh my God, uh, I want to see meet Ashton. I've never met Ashton, and he punked me. And she's like, bitch, please, Ashton didn't punk you. I punked you. And then she said some of the questions. I was like, oh my God. You are the one. She's like, yeah. Didn't you like the gay question? Wasn't that funny? <laughs> it was just, oh. it was so great. It was really, really great. So to me, ended up punking me on, uh, on punked, and uh, but it was the same thing. Like you just kind of you go, you do your job. I feel like everybody's out there trying to do their job, and half of you don't know what you're doing, and it's not your fault. I still don't. And half of you don't even know who I am or what who somebody is and what they're doing. There's so many celebrities, and this was. God, that was already like 20 years ago. So, or, or, I don't know, 10 years ago. So, you know, there were less celebrities then, but now it's like, like, how does anybody know who anybody is and what they do? <laughs> yeah, with the influencers now, everyone's a celebrity. Yeah. Yeah. So people, <laughs> I don't think they realize you started out as a model and were you were incredibly successful with that. And that's Obviously a tough profession. Obviously my Instagram this week. <laughs> I've seen some of the pictures. Tomorrow. It's my birthday tomorrow, so I've been doing all my composites, you know, your comp cards of when you're a model, you have a comp card that you give out with all with your pictures on it. And so also, also I have not had a haircut since coronavirus, so I am struggling with a bad, bad grow out. But um, it's, it's very long back there. I'm just trying to hide it. With um, that face, you don't have to worry about hair. <laughs> so yeah, it's been funny. I've been posting all my old uh, composite cards and just, it's just people don't think of me as having a life other than dressing celebrities or that I had a whole career before that. And I think it was very interesting because I started like as a teen, I worked at Studio 54 and then I started modeling because I got discovered. Uh -huh. and, um, and then I went on to model. It wasn't the old like I got discovered and then I was a big success. It kind of works different. But yeah. <laughs> wow. Was, but I mean, you did all these amazing campaigns and stuff. So I can't wait to pull those things off the Instagram for your story. You're going to have a hell of a feature. It's, it's really amazing. I was just saying to somebody yesterday, you know, um, of all the things I've done in my career, I've been one of People Magazine's sexiest bachelors. I've written two books. I put the good stuff first. I've written <laughs> two, two books. I've been the, uh, the creative director for the NFL. I've been the creative director for the Miss America, Miss Universe, and Miss Teen USA pageants. I've just I've done 14 movies. Uh, I don't know how many TV shows, etc. And those comp cards probably are my most valuable um, thing. I, I, I and I was talking with a friend of mine yesterday that I've known for many years, and she was saying like, it's so funny to see this part of you. And she knew it, but she's like, I forgot that you had that whole career and you were such a baby. And you know, I was like 20, but I was doing work as like a 14 and 16 year old. You know, I was like. A teenager i looked always looked really young and i just said uh, i think because i worked so hard as a teenager and a, a kid in school i loved the fashion business and i wanted to be in the fashion business and then i went to new york and i got to work at studio 54 and i got to be around all these celebrities Cher and kate jackson and stevie wonder and bianca jagger just every margo hemingway mariel hemingway everybody and uh, all the models, Patty Hansen and Julie Foster, and my girl Gia, who I, you know, I, I had a, a, my summer with Gia. Just so many experiences. So to actually get into that business and be successful at that business and, and be able to have not one composite, but eight composites. So like I had a, you know, you do a composite like every year. So for me, I kept an eight year co career as a male model is, is just not easy in those times. It wasn't, it wasn't like, now I think it's difficult again, but in between it was easier. <laughs> now mm -hmm. I think it's really hard because there's so much competition. But somewhere in the 90s, 2000s, it became easier to have a career. And the last thing I'll say on the modeling is, I, I, two things I want to say on it. When I started in the 80s, and I had this conversation with Susan Lucci from All My Children. Have, have you met Susan? I have not. She's amazing. <laughs> she's a New Yorker and she's a very amazing person and she's very honest. And she talks about how when she got started on All My Children, which is in the 70s, um, and when she got to New York to, to work, she was too ethnic. She was too exotic. And those were all the words they used for me. When I, when I went to agencies, even like when I went to Zoli, which was known for I remember Zoli. models. 
Exactly. Zoli was for exotic models if you were different. And even there, they were like, you're just too different. You don't look like anybody else. You're too ethnic. And it was just funny that those are the words they used and they said them to your face very, very, um, very deliberately. They would just say, oh, you know, you're too this or you're too that. And I, I thought that was fascinating. And now here we are. And, you know, I'm like run of the mill. I'm like everybody else at this point. I'm not exotic or different. But in that time I was and, mm -hmm. and beauty was a different standard. And lastly, I'll say the best thing about modeling for me was the validation because to this day at the years old, <laughs> um, if anybody ever, you know, on all these dating sites, people are kind of weird on dating sites and mean, and they're like, oh, you're old or you're ugly or look at your face or oh, whatever people say. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, bitch, I've been in Italian Vogue and I walked the runway for Gautier and Jean-Paul Gautier and Galliano. Like, dude. You don't even know. I don't even get into the fact that I was one of People Magazine's out of bachelors. I don't even get into the other shit. Just in my head, I just think, and that's so funny, my validation came at that point. Like, I think if I stopped everything from that point, I always would have been secure in myself because I got my validation so early. I wanted all that so bad, and those eight composites, when I post them today, I feel just so grateful for those and that acceptance into a business that I loved and to be accepted into this day, it's like a fraternity, you know, the amazing Cara Young and, you know, all the Veronica Webb and Pat Cleveland and, you know, all the people that I met in those days on my journey and everybody's at a different place in their journey to, to get to here today and be friends with them and be a part of all of it. I went to Orbe's funeral back in September. It was such a sad day, but it was so amazing at the same time because you just saw all these people you've worked with your whole life, Garen from the plaza. And <laughs> he's always Garen from the plaza for me, you know, Garen. From the plaza, and yeah. And Sandy Lintner and Mary Greenwell and just, you know, oh my God, I just can't even think of everybody that was there that are just the best. Cindy Crawford and Stephanie Seymour and Veronica was there and, and Leah Kabidi and just so many people and Amber Valletta. I got to help Amber down the stairs. I still feel like I'm always a kid in the candy store and I can't believe they've let me in. Perfect. That's perfect. That's really, and that is a dream fulfilled for anyone. Each, yeah, each so person I'm has done. their own candy anyway, store. Take care. Have a great day. <laughs> Pleasure. Thanks for coming by. All right, let's go to commercial. There's the uh, lesson. Live your dream and get on with your life. <laughs> yes. If you're allowed to leave the house, live your dream. But also you skipped over. You, you knocked out $2 million in jewelry. Oh, Remember? yeah, that was pretty good, too. That was That's not a bad thing. thing. That was a challenge. I don't even remember half the things I've done along the way. I think yep. that because I came at a time that I was always the beginning of something. There was no stylist really known before me. There were other stylists, but they weren't known before me. When I started the modeling, I was different. I was like 5'11", 5 5'10 5 and a half, really. And, you know, everybody else was a 42 reg. I was a 42 reg if I put a jacket underneath it. Like at John Paul Gautier, the first time I walked for Gautier, I left my clothes on in the casting and I put the samples on over my clothes. And I came out and they were like, looks great. And they're like, oh, let me just touch it. I'm like, oh, no, it's fine. I'll move it. I mean, Perfect. literally, and as they, were, as they were fidgeting, I could tell the person doing the fitting knew I had the clothes underneath and he didn't say anything. And he, at one point, the, I don't even know who it was. John Paul was there, but it was the person kind of doing it. And Tanel was there, the model Tanel. And I could, the person like looked at, caught my eye at one moment and it was kind of like, I'm not going to tell. Oh. And I, I just knew in that moment that it was like, I know, and I'm not going to ruin this for you. And nice. I'm going to let you have this. And, and I just kept thinking, Oh, please, God, don't let them tell me it's too big. Please just let the clothes fit. And, you know, they did whatever they did. I took them off and I was like, okay. And I went back to the agency and, you know, the agency, you can, by the time you get back there, they'd usually call to confirm you. And so I walked in and they were like, oh, Gautier, congratulations, your first show. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. And, you know, I still, I just, I just uh, chatted with Tanel. Uh, two weeks ago on Instagram, it's phenomenal. Instagram and, and and all these things, especially Instagram, is such a great thing to people, old geez, old geez like myself, 
who want to stay in touch with our friends from the industry. You know, I hadn't talked to Tanel in 20 years and it was just like, oh my God, remember this and remember that. And it's just so funny. funny it's like a beautiful high school reunion. Yeah, yeah. A digital <laughs> high school reunion. All right. Exactly. So you did two books. I have The Shopping Diet. And then if you had five minutes with the president, there's so many other things uh, that you've written. What made you want to write? Um, you know, I, I was a very troubled student. I actually barely passed uh, high school. Um, that was a difficult procedure for me. I just wasn't very interested in school. I was a, I was a pretty wild kid. I was, I was smoking weed when I was 12 and doing drugs. I used to do acid and I was a partier and school just kind of really got in the way. And, it um, always does. But I didn't yeah. let it. I didn't let it get in the way. <laughs> I'm no quitter, and so you know I had definitely a hard time. And luckily, uh, I went to see a movie, Mahogany, um, when I was probably in maybe tenth or eleventh grade, and um, I just walked out of that movie theater with my parents. And I said, "Oh, that's my life. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a model. I'm going to be a designer. I'm going to go to Europe. I'm going to get the fuck out of here." I'm gonna leave all these people because I got things to do. I see my destiny. I'm leaving tomorrow. <laughs> I had like a dollar fifty. I wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> but I wasn't going anywhere. I saw a light and I saw a way out. And I was like, I really was like, I'm done. I'm done here. I'm just going there. And like, and and it changed everything for me. I just sort of saw everything different. I was like, okay, how do I get out of here? Before I was just trying to figure out how do I survive here in Long Island, selling weed and like hanging out with pretty girls. Like, how do I keep this gig up my whole life? I'm gonna live at least another ten or fifteen years. How do I make this work? You know, when you're like fifteen, 50. you just don't even have a clue what it's all yeah. gonna be like. You know, it's so all like, all right, I like what's going on now. I just want to. And then all of a sudden, I was like, oh, there's more, and pretty girls. I really love pretty girls. And I was like, oh my god, this is like. Gloria and, and Liz Butler and Grace, these are even better than them. They're even prettier than Kitty. And, you know, these are really, you know. These are fine girls. ladies. Yeah, these are really beautiful girls. And it's so funny because, like, the girls in high school were sort of the girls in the modeling business for me. And anyway, my I had this, this great uh, art teacher, and I was creative in art, and she saw something in me when I showed up for class, which was a problem, because I didn't really go to class. My parents were kind of doing their own thing and I was doing my thing. And um, one day they got called into the office. They got called in many days. And the, the teacher, Mrs. DeQuilpa, who just passed away two years ago and I went to her funeral actually. So that was a nice full circle. And I had a nice thing with her kids. Her kids were like, oh my God, I can't believe it. There were only myself and one other student showed up after all her years in the system. Very interesting, but she changed my life. So I went, I saw it in the paper, two people were sent it to me and said, I, I still have a lot of my, I still have a lot of my model friends from high school, <laughs> my model girlfriends, you know, people love you. <laughs> they never modeled, but in my head, they were models. <laughs> they were super, and, uh, they were the first supermodels. They were the first supermodels in Seaford. Sorry, like, Kara. Sorry, Veronica. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Kara. She knows, she knows. And, um, it's so funny. So my parents went to the school and, and. And the teacher saw my parents and I look like my mom. I have my mom's cheekbones, my father's eyes. And she kind of looked at them and she said, are you Philip's parents? And my father said, well, it depends what he did. <laughs> and, I like him already. And, yeah, yeah, you know, they, they already knew. They were in the school. They were called down for like the 90th time. And she said, you know, I think your son is very special. And my father's like, yes, that's one of the words people describe him as. <laughs> and she said, he has a lot of talent. He says, yes, that's been said also. He just doesn't seem to be living up to his talent. And my father says, yes, <laughs> that is my problem as a father. And Thank you. Said, well, I can help. And he said, he's yours. <laughs> Take I him, he's him. yours. Congratulations. Do what you want with him. Long story short, that night they developed, and this is 1970s, you know, I mean, this is late 70s, early 80s. And they developed a special program for me that I didn't have to do the rest of the schoolwork. They got me through. I graduated with a 67 average. <laughs> Woo! You it can 65. be done. They gave me those two points. Get him out of here. Oh. Go, go, go. And off I went. 
off I went and I went to the city and, and I, I have a life because that teacher believed in me. So teachers, teachers are very, very important. If you find a teacher that believes in you, your kids can do a lot of things they never thought they were going to do. Change your life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, change the people world. like you, <laughs> I find always are challenged with school because school is not a challenge. It's boring. You have the uh, creativity. Your mind is making things and thinking uh, of so many countless it was things. So small. It was like this big. Everything that they had. Uh, Protractors and algebra. I've not done one thing in anything I learned in school. Didn't happen afterwards. You're I not using your algebra. I learned Spanish, French, and Italian living in Spain, France, and Italy. I didn't learn anything in the class. I got kicked out of every time. There was a no-win situation. Everybody in Long Island should go, go be a fashion model instead. <laughs> you should open the Long Island School of Modeling. You teach them yes, how to dress, yes, how to exactly. make clothing, how to model, whatever. <laughs> That's exactly. Stuff. All right, let's Self hit some high points. It's just solid. Write books, write books. I want to do some bullet points for people who might not realize. Okay. You did a collaboration with Michael Jackson on his final two covers. That's gigantic. Yes. Yeah. The NFL, you dressed 12 celebrities for the Oscars, modeled for all the that top was places. One year. That was what? one year. That was 1996. That oh, it didn't say it was one year. Oh, my God. That was only one year. That was like the first year before there were stylists really in LA or they were known. And it was the first year of them going to the Oscars for Will, Jada, Selma Hayek, J-Lo, um, Lauren Holly, Jim Carrey, um, Gabriel Byrne, Fran Drescher, um, Faye Dunaway, Angela Bassett, and Courtney B. Vance, and I think Julia Ormond. Julia Ormond. Oh my oh, God. Oh, Sandy Bullock and Sandy Bullock. It was 13. It's 12 wow. or 13. Sandy Bullock, too. Sandy Bullock's first time at the Oscars, also. All of them. Jada, Will, all their first times. And you had to make them look good. I did. No well, there pressure there. Else here. There were a few stylists, but there weren't really a lot of stylists. Like like now, everybody's a stylist. <laughs> yeah, and they're all they philanthropists say. and producers and directors and stuff. Uh, one of the things they said that um, you're credited with bringing glamour back to Hollywood. That was something I always missed because I'd see those older movies and people like Cary Grant and uh, Anita Ekberg and Sophia Loren. They themselves had glamour, even if you put them in a bathrobe. What? How did you feel the challenge was for what you had to work with as far as the Hollywood people that were available? Uh, <laughs> well. Yeah, it's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to name names. Well, I, I came, came at the time, you know, I mean, it was, it was like, I, I feel like I went from one school in Long Island, then I went into the city and that was a craziness. That was like a frat party for a couple of years. And, um, and then I got into modeling, which ended up becoming like another school. And you know, you go through the classes and the people in the school and everybody gets to know each other. And then um, I moved back to New York in the uh, beginning of the 90s and it was all like voguing and, and the, uh, the, the house of extravaganza and all the houses, which it's so interesting to see that come to, 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 to public media now and to be so out there, you know, I mean, I was there before Madonna was even stealing it. You know, I mean, I was like hanging out with the House of Extravaganza and none of them knew I was a model. Like some of them did, the ones I was really close with, because that was all their dream. And I felt so bad that I had lived their dream and I had been successful and that they were just all poor and struggling. It was, it was a very interesting time in my head because I'd had so much success and yet I was still pretty young and I entered into this world of voguing and models. Anyway. I left that and went to New York. I had, I had a job with Naomi Campbell for Vibe Magazine. I was the first fashion editor at Vibe Magazine. And speaking of how do you work with what you got, um, nobody would give clothes to black people. I couldn't get clothes for black people. I called, I called Ralph Lauren and they were like, oh, it's not our market. And I don't even know if Tommy was in business at yet. And Calvin was like, oh no, black people, that's not for us. They don't buy our clothes. It's like, oh, you think we're, who do you think's buying your underwear? Who's buying your jeans? And um, 
all the all the designers wouldn't do it. And then um, I called Mark Jacobs, who was a friend of mine. I'd known Mark since we were 17 on the Upper West Side. We were kids together. And I called Mark, and Mark was at Perry Ellis. And Mark was like, oh, absolutely. No problem. Like, didn't even bat an eyelash, of course. Yeah, you know, because it was it was uh, Jonathan Van Meter, who was a big writer for Vogue at the time, became the editor-in-chief. And Quincy Jones was behind the, the, the magazine at the beginning. And so... It was a great start, but it was very hard. Then I came to Hollywood right after that. Like within a year of that, I, I came to Hollywood. And at the same time, again, like the next class started and, and they all those people were coming at the same time. Jada and Will and Renee Zellweger and Selma, J-Lo, you know, all, all those people were coming and we just started together. And so we kind of started the business together. But there was no connection between New York, Europe and Hollywood. Mm. And, and as a model, like I knew all the design houses, as a stylist in New York, that's how I became a stylist because I was like, what am I going to do where I can hang around with pretty girls and eat in great restaurants and wear great clothes? What am I going to do? And one of my editors, Sasha Gambaccini, who used to be at Harper's Bazaar for years, now I think she's at Vanity Fair Italia. Uh, she's married to Wayne Mazer. I love Sasha, if you're watching. Um, Sasha launched my, my modeling career and then she was like, you should be a stylist. I was like, what am I going to do? My hair is getting thin. I'm getting old. What am I going to do? I was, you know, I was like, you're 24. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, my career is finished. It's Get over. my cane. I can't do another composite. <laughs> <laughs> no more modeling cards. I can't walk another runway. My back hurts. Um, and she's like, oh, you should be a stylist. Because I was always that, that model that came to the shoot. And I was like, I don't want to wear that. Can I wear this? Can I put that with that? Or I'd be like, oh, I like this. Can I put it? And I'd put it on. They'd be like, go out in that. <laughs> or right. you know, I'd come in something and they'd say, just leave that on. <laughs> you know, they'd say, oh, should we do his hair? I had wild, curly, curly, wild hair. And they'd be like, nah, just leave his hair. Just send him out there. Like, I was like the guy you could just send out there. Mm -hmm. Like, I'd put anything on, too big, too small. It worked. And it would work. It would be cool and I would go. <laughs> Even Camera ready. So anyway, when I got to Hollywood, it was really a matter of connecting the celebrities to the designers and making that connection there. And so everybody says, you know, I'm the first stylist or I get a lot of credit for being the first stylist. And it wasn't that I was the first stylist. There were a lot of great stylists there before me, Stephen Arabino and Deborah Wapney. May she rest in peace. May, he, may Stephen rest in peace. And Vivian Turner and... Um, there were a lot of good stylists there before me. They just didn't have the connections that I have. And then the media thing happened. You have to realize like ETV and InStyle Magazine, all those started in the same time that Selma and JLo came to Hollywood. Before that, the models were on the cover. And then somewhere in that period in the late 90s, they changed over to putting celebrities on cover. So it was really a matter of being the right person in the right time. And I just became the face of it because there was nobody else who would show up and just do it like I did. Like, same thing with the modeling or school. Like, you know, I just kind of showed up and did it. Well, school, I didn't show up as much, but I just did it. <laughs> I didn't want to bring that up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You got well, the transcript. I didn't show up at lunchtime for weed. That's where I sold weed. <laughs> and um, they'll never the miss the lunch. All these crimes are unpunishable now. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think I passed the statue of limitations. I'm not really worried about talking about it at this point. It's kind of legal anyway right now, except for the... Yeah, I'm in California. I'm safe. I'm safe. So, yeah. uh, you know, it was really interesting to bring the designers to the, the celebrities, and that didn't exist. And so the interesting thing is kind of where my career went a different direction was, I think, by the mid-2000s. Um, Ah, oh, Douglas Forbes. Hi, Douglas Forbes. Yes, you did. <laughs> I remember that. Um, I, you know, I think it was kind of interesting to be able to bring the celebrities together. But once, basically, what happened was, what had happened was, once I Tell us what happened. together, they didn't need me anymore. And then I realized, oh, wow, these people are really shallow and superficial, and nobody really actually likes me. I just fit <laughs> into what they need. And I'm just a vessel to what everybody really wants. So no one actually it likes I'm funny and I'm not pretentious. <laughs> and, you know, I just kind of went a different direction. I was like, fuck these people. I literally 
I called uh, Rachel Zoe. I, I had a very, very big client that I was very close with him when she kind of turned crazy, which they all do. Um, some of them, it's taken a few decades, but they all show who they are really at the end. Um, I called I called Rachel and I was like, I'm done. I'm done. I hate this fucking town. <laughs> they're yours. They're not, they're not your friends. I literally called out who she was working with and I was like, her, she's not your friend. Her, she's okay. But that one, definitely not your friend. Watch out. Like, I literally went through a list and I Good said, oh, I have, I was like, you can have that one. Good luck. <laughs> you should work with her. So I knew like who everybody should go with. When I was done, I was like, I'm done with you all. I'm done with you. I'm gonna leave here and have a nice life. I'm done with you all. And um, I was, I was really done. But the devil is is, is tricky. <laughs> I bet. Oh yes. Yeah. Like like the Godfather, yeah, they keep pulling you back in. They pull you. It's like the mob. You can't get out of this business. You yep. only get out dead. Yep. <laughs> You go to jail or you die. That's it. And jail is just temporary. True, true. A debtor's prison. You end up in debtor's prison, or or you, or or you win an Oscar and you and you're good. But yeah, it was really interesting. I just I um, it was so interesting to see who were my friends and who weren't my friends and who called and who didn't call, and you know it's just funny to see what people's agendas are and what people's versions of things are. You know and and. Now it's been very interesting. Um, Vogue, Vogue does a thing about uh, who, to who their looks, the looks of different celebrities, and there have been one or two of my celebrities that they have profiled, and it's just so interesting to hear their version of what the history is. <laughs> oh, their version with you, okay. Revisionist history. There's a lot of revisionist history. Oh yeah, my stylist didn't want me to wear the tiara. I was the only one who wanted to wear the tiara, and I never got credit for wearing the tiara. Well, you didn't get credit because you didn't want to wear it. You were scared. And I talked you into wearing the tiara, and I told you all about how Audrey Hepburn had worn a tiara and how Lily Tomlin had worn a tiara to the Oscars, because you didn't know any of that shit. And you were worried that you had to wear an ugly Armani dress that you didn't like, and you were wondering how you were going to get attention your first time at the Oscars. That's how that story really went. If you go on Vogue, there's a different version. I'm not going to say who it was, but just look up Selma Hayek. Anyway, um, anyway uh, oops, did I drop some tea? <laughs> yes, you did. I, I went to just, I, I went to high school with Rachel Zoe, Rachel oh, Rosenzweig. What year was that really? <laughs> I really did. Yeah. What, what year? year? I'll tell you off camera. That really? What's that? What year was that really? I can't say. I'll tell you when we're done. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. But I've I know. For a long time, I don't know how she's so much younger than me. <laughs> well, that's that's Hollywood math. They do it on yeah. their films. They do it on the production, and they do it on themselves. Yeah, it's interesting. If, if somebody I've had to play, a long time, she's a lot younger than me now. <laughs> she probably gets younger as the years go by. Ish. <laughs> if someone had to play you in a movie, given how I've met you and, and know who you are, who, knowing yourself, do you think could pull off being you? Having to be a model with the model looks, and then the design, the talent, the drugs, LSD flashbacks <laughs> yeah. in, in, the, in the art uh, classroom. Um, oh gosh, I don't know. I think you'd have to have three actors. You know, it's a long story. <laughs> okay. It's a long story. But I did a Ken doll, you know, Mattel. Yes, hired they me. brought you in to, to revolutionize Ken and, and update yes, him. Yes, yes, I, I got to do a makeover on Ken. And so Ken was part Orlando Bloom, part uh, Pierce Brosnan, wow. and part Jim Carrey, and part me. And that's what I said was kind of, again, this was 10 years ago. I would probably change that casting now, but funny. Grown and sexy, sexy, you know, I mean, and, and people used to say I look like Orlando a lot back in the day when I had the little mustache and the, the hair and, you know. I see it, I don't absolutely. Know, I, I really don't know who would do that. Um, I always like, I think like someone like John Leguizamo is really talented. He can pull off anything, yeah. Yeah, uh, Jamie Foxx could pull it off, I think. He actually could. <laughs> you gotta be able to dance and sing and do it all. There might be a little racial issue there, but I don't mind. It's not like, uh, 
what was it when Zoe Saldana played Nina Simone or something? I, I don't care about that stuff. <laughs> oh, I know. They have a Hawaiian girl plays the Chinese girl and everybody's yeah, yeah, yeah. mind. Well, Emma Stone played Emma Stone played yeah. the, the Hawaiian girl. <laughs> I know. Jamie Foxx could play me. He could do it. Jamie Foxx is spectacular. He, there's nothing he can't do. I remember in Living Color and now look at what he's done. Oh, you never know that. So talented. You'd never so, see that so coming. Talented. I'm, I'm, I'm the biggest lover of talent. I, I love beautiful girls and talent. Uh, my biggest, my biggest wish in the world would be to sing. I'm, I'm a very frustrated singer and I can't oh. really sing. But that would be my. It's the one thing I can't do and the one thing I haven't been able to do at all. I, I it doesn't stop me. But, um, <laughs> You're a karaoke <laughs> maniac. Uh, no, I, I won't do that because that would be too telling. That would be too telling. But I, I don't That'll be on TMZ every night. Yeah, yeah. He's back. I bust into song at, 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 at an opportune time. But, um, and I do some fun driving in my truck with the uh, the radio on videos that people love. But, uh, but no real singing. But that's like my biggest, I, I love singers. Like I get so emotional when I see talent and I, I'm fascinated by history. I'm fascinated by history and and the, the course of a lifetime, you know, like Michael or, and I think in my, in my career, I've been very anointed and I've had many, very many blessings to be, um, if you look up the word, the meaning of a prophet, a prophet is someone in charge of legacy, is someone who is, who is commissioned by God to tell stories and not to be grandiose by any means, but I am. <laughs> you got the stories, you're the prophet. I'm, I'm a prophet, you know, people say, me. Oh my God, you're an angel. Oh my God, you're a unicorn. Oh my God, you're so amazing. I'm like, no, I'm just in charge of legacy. Like I now know that that's what my, my calling on life has been legacy and to tell stories and tell people stories is now I work on films. I'm, I'm producing and creating films about black history and black beauty and, and history in Hollywood. And I have a couple projects I'm working on and in with Queen Latifah and Tracy Edmonds and you know, uh, the Lionsgate studio, they're, they're big projects. And the funny thing is, you know, we do photo shoots and you do, uh, you know, I don't know how many photo shoots in a year and it all happens so fast. In the last five years, I've been working on this and people are like, what are you doing these days? Where are you? No one's seen you. I'm like, I'm busy. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the studio. I'm making movies. It takes a long time to get movies made, but I think there's some good surprises for people in the next year or two. So it's very interesting and it's all about telling stories and being in charge of legacy, I guess, you know, I, I never thought of it that way. I guess I knew it. I knew, I knew what I wanted. I just didn't. And I knew it was about legacy. When I, when I was uh, very young in, in Paris, the first time I used to walk along the Seine and they have all the old magazines on the, on the, along the Seine that you can buy. And I used to see the covers of the magazines and think, that's how you remember. That's how I want to be remembered by my covers and by magazines. And I thought that that's what history is. And, and as I've now grown into an adult, <laughs> last year, last right. year, adolescence, I'm You're trying out. this uh, this grown up thing, adulting, adulting. Now that yeah. I'm adulting, <laughs> don't um, let it stick. Yeah, <laughs> too many rules. Um, it's fascinating when I. When I think back to, um, I'm working right now on a project about black trans lives mattering and black black trans lives. And I look at Marsha P. Johnson and um, and Sylvia Rivera in, in the park in the East Village in the 90s and the voguing days. And they were fighting to have lesbians incorporated in with the gays, like because the gays didn't want the lesbians with them at the same march and everything. And there was a moment that it happened and I was there. And I was just re-looking at that video the other day and I was like, I was there. That's history. And I think so much of everything in, in my history was, I was in the middle of history. I'm like the Forrest Gump of fashion and, and culture. And, you know, I've just kind of been in all these places in the right moment. And I think why it always worked for me is because I've always felt like an outsider invited in and I was so amazed to be invited in. I never realized I was in the middle of it. I just thought I was looking in on it and I was, I didn't know I was part of it. And, and uh, when I saw that movie, um, Straight Out of Compton, and I thought, oh my God, I'm part of that. Like I hung out in Compton for years and I had my truck and I'd hang out on the strip and NWA and you know, like 
power to the people. That was like my my 90s life when I got here. You know, I mean, yeah, I was in the, the you know, it was kind of a recurrence of my New York life of like hanging out. And it's just so funny. And you don't realize you're living in the middle of history when it when you're in the middle of it. You you just don't understand it. And now I just look back at certain things. I'm like, oh, my God, that's like my life. That's my history. Studio 54. Who knew that was a part of history? It was just a job I went to and took off my clothes every night and put on little shorts. <laughs> we need about seven books on you. There, need, there needs to be uh, like a discovery series about you. Yeah. There's... What's that kid, the lion guy with the Tiger King? Oh, the Tiger King? Yeah. We'll have a... Uh... got nothing on me. Absolutely not. The Cumberbund King or something. We'll come yeah, up with something. Yeah, exactly, the Bowtie King. Exactly. That could be, that could be. Now, the state of America and the whole world actually is wow. not just in flux. It's in, uh, it's a tragedy. It's, it's chaotic. Do you think there's hope for what's going on? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I live in a lot of hope. You know, I live, I have a, home, I have a tattoo, uh, Dolly's uh, Dove, and it says peace, love, and hope. I have a lot of tattoos, but um, that one particularly says peace, love, and hope. And, I, and I'm a dreamer. I have another one right there, I think. Yeah, that's it. And it's praying hands, and it says, Je suis un revier. I'm a dreamer. And it's from John, uh, <laughs> not John Legend. <laughs> John Lennon. Um, John Lennon. John Lennon. And another good John. A dreamer. And uh, the other John. And um, and I so I think it's important to dream, to be a dreamer, and to have hope. Um, I think this is uh, sort of biblical times that we live in. I think we are seeing things that we've never seen before. I think we have basically a Hitler running the country. I mean, I, I think when history tells itself, he will be revealed as as the most hated president of all time, and he will be told in history as as Hitler. He will be told as I think we have not seen the worst of him. I, I believe that September, October, November are going to be very, 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 very dangerous times. Very dangerous times in the streets. I think what we mm -hmm. saw a month ago is exactly what we're going to see more of. And that's only because he's going to incite it. John, Trump will incite it because he wants to be the president of law and order. So he is going to incite chaos and, and fighting which is his, his way is to be divisive. He's not to bring people together, but to be divisive in all those people that are divisive and that just want, it's so funny. Um, I'm a contrarian, you know, I mean, uh, if, if you say, go do this, I'm going to go do that. I just, I'm a contrarian. The minute I, I finish something, or if I'm successful at something, I'm like, oh, like you said, oh, that's so easy. I want to go do something else. Oh my God, you're so amazing at this. I want to sing. Of course I want to sing because I can't sing. Because I can't. Like, of course I want to do that. That's all I want to do is be a singer because I can't sing. <laughs> so I'm a contrarian. I, I, I think that um, all these people that are just behind him just to be contrarians, you know, they just, they, they have no argument. They just want to argue with whatever everybody's saying. So he is the arguing candidate, not the, it's a, and everything he says is the opposite of what he's saying. And everybody he accuses of something is, what he's doing. So all those people, it's all that bait and switch. And they're all those people you really don't want to have a conversation with because they're just looking to argue and they don't really have facts. So with that said, I believe that he will scorch and burn. I think that he will do everything possible to create race riots across the country. I think there will be lives lost and businesses lost. I think the fires are just beginning. I think the riots are just beginning. I think he will incite all of that. I think the closer we get to the election, and I don't say this as like, oh my God, the sky is falling. I just say this as, this is the path we're on. And I believe that he will scorch and burn and from the ashes, we will re rebuild. And I think that we need to rebuild. I, I you know, um, all the walls have come down. I was one of the last people to get over the wall. I don't know how I made it over the wall of success. But, you know, the white man and his rules, I made it over that wall. I was an influencer when there weren't influencers. I was the original one kind of on TV. And I made it over that wall just before the walls broke and everybody became an influencer and everyone was a philanthropist and everyone was a model and every, everyone's doing what I was doing. I just got to do it first and kind of last, <laughs> you know? So I think that it's very important to realize that this is coming probably and I think it's good. I, I think it's bad, very, very bad for all of us in the businesses. But I believe that 
what will come afterwards will be so much better because I think so many of these systems are archaic. I've lived through all of the Me Too moment. I have my own versions of Me Too. I was raped when I was 18 and drugged and raped and, you know, blah, 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 blah. I had instances like that within the fashion industry. And uh, there was a big story in the Daily Mail. You can Google it. It's a great story. Um, it's a two-day two story and there's like 30 pictures and it's a long, long story about you know, being friends with Russell Simmons and Trump and Harvey Weinstein and so many of the men that were accused of, um, you know, be, being, uh, you know, basically misogynistic and raping women. And it wasn't seen that way when it was happening. But as history has been retold, that is the way it is seen now. And that's what it was. It just nice. wasn't seen that way. It was that. We didn't have the words. For me, one of the big words that came into play was predator. And predator in chief, the predator in chief. Um, so I think he is it's very symbolic. I think it is no coincidence we have the biggest misogynist, the biggest liar, the biggest thief. He is the antithesis of all of that, Bill Cosby, all of that white male supremacist domination that has been running society for so long and has not been good and has not been good and has been fair to one it has been fair to white men and i think it's so interesting um white women have been you know we i i, I read a lot and, and i was reading recently about you know where they talk about you know uh free country and justice for all well yeah if you're a white man period but nobody else has been free women weren't free women are chained behind the the stove for years and years and years and years and years they weren't free they didn't have the right to vote black people couldn't vote gay people couldn't. like justice for all except <laughs> justice right. for all if you're a white man and you have power and money otherwise good luck <laughs> well, they just so had the thing very promising times we live in i think it is extremely important for people of color to be careful i think that um there's a lot of evil out there in them backwoods and I'm not saying anything I don't think anybody doesn't really know. I think people maybe want to deny it or live in denial of it. But um, it's there. It's going to happen. It's happening. There have been five lynchings in the past few weeks. Lynchings in 2020. I mean, seriously. Uh, I mean, the things that are going on with the police officers. Police officers, I've never personally had a good ex uh, experience with a police officer. I've been arrested many times in many countries. Yeah. And, um... Interpol's you know, got you, man. The you know, profit wanted in seven countries. You know, yeah, I've been arrested all over the country, all over the world. I mean, I have definitely been arrested quite a few times. And, um, but, you know, I've done what I needed to do and what I wanted to do. And, you know, I, I wasn't robbing banks. I wasn't killing anybody. But, you know, I mean, I've been in a wrong place for a wrong time. And um, I think that's part of living. you got to have a little fun and you got to try different things. And, you know. I've had God on my side, so I'm lucky. But I think it's important to to realize that you have to, you've got to be safe. You know, I think we have to be safe out there now. I think people really have to be careful. I think there's a lot of evil intent out there right now. And um, I think the police do need to be re-educated. I think they're, they're supposed to be um, um, officers of peace, peace officers. They are here to protect and serve, not arrest and, and pummel um, or strangle. I mean, the, the, the things I've posted over the last few months are just so heartbreaking and traumatic to watch. I mean, just it's just unconscionable, the behavior of a lot of the police. And I say a lot of the police, I'm sure you know, it's not everybody, but the fact that I've been able to post two or three new videos every day for the past several weeks, just about of uh, bad police officers taking advantage and hurting people, pinching their noses so they can't breathe and die. I mean, there's a lot of bad people doing a lot of bad things. It doesn't mean you have to kill them. If I think of all the bad things I've done over the years, I would, if my skin were darker, I would probably be dead. I've been arrested because I look just sketchy enough. <laughs> I've got tattoos. I'm kind of, I love the, I love the uh, passing. Uh, Sorry, Philip. <laughs> Furzy, it's a zoo here. Um, faux fur. Water. She's a faux fur cat. Oh, for a cat. Yes. No, I almost were really harmed in the making of this show. Yes. Um, I think it's a very it's, I green think it's show. Very, very important, though, to, to, to 
realized that because my skin is just a little bit lighter, I probably didn't get killed. I got arrested because I have tattoos. I got arrested because I wear a hoodie. I got arrested because I look a certain way that doesn't look like everybody else or like the cops think you should look. Um, and I've gotten arrested in Central Park, which I lived on Central Park West, and they would be like, they'd stop me. What are you doing in here? I'm taking a walk. What are you doing here at seven in the morning? I'm taking a walk. I live on Central Park West. Oh yeah, sure you do. Because I had a tank top on and a fitted and I didn't look like what they thought somebody living on Central Park West should live and took me in because I didn't oh. have an ID. It was seven in the morning. Took me in. Took me in. Arrested. ID and everything. I had huh? a bottle of Starbucks. I had a st bottle of Starbucks coffee in my hand and you're not allowed to bring bottles into Central Park at that time. I don't know if you still can. Ask Karen. Can you still do that, Karen? <laughs> Karen. They know Karen, all the rules. what's up? Um, you know, I mean, so I, hey, I Karen. think that I've been, you know, people say, oh, police and black me. Like, if you just, it really is if you don't look like what they think you should look like is really the problem. It's not just black, it's Latinos, it's, it's everything. If you're not what they think, police are just, uh, they're aggressive and they, they, they should, they should have um, psychological training seminars every year. They should, you know, you work at Google or whatever and they have these, uh, things where you go away for a week and you get to Hawaii and it's a whole happy time for the workers. They don't do that for police. Police should get that every year. They should have a week vacation in Hawaii and de-stress and it's a very stressful job, but they don't do that. It's so interesting. Our most important jobs in this country, our teachers, our nurses, our, our, our frontline workers that we saw and, and, and the police should be treated like kings and queens because they protect us and they are in charge of us really and yet they're not protected themselves and I don't think they know enough to ask obviously to be protected they're not enlightened enough they're not evolved enough unfortunately that's part of the education they need is an awareness of what of a mental awareness they, they don't function on in, in, intuition in the least I just posted a video the other day that happened in California a year ago a man was in a, a van with his friend, a, a female friend, and uh, they were in an SUV and the man was crippled from the handicap, from the, the chest I down. I saw your post. From the chest down. The man had just peed into his catheter. He had to pee in a catheter. That's what he has to do every time he has to relieve himself is to pee into a catheter. I don't know if anybody knows about how to, how to um, be with people that are handicapped and what they experience of going to the bathroom is just, like, is just the most degrading thing possible for a person in a wheelchair that has to go to the bathroom in public places. It's, it's very difficult and, um, and not accommodated. And the cops literally came over six times, three times you saw, three times he said, I'm, I'm paraplegic, I, I'm paralyzed. And the girl said, he's paralyzed. But, and they were screaming at him and yelling at him and dragged him out of the car with his pants down. I mean, like, so disrespectful. And it's just, just one of many cases that we see of just beating senselessly, arresting the wrong person, beating them to a pulp, damaging them, hurting them, killing them. And then, oh, well, we made a mistake and nothing happens. I mean, Breonna Taylor, all, all day, every day. Breonna Taylor, Breonna Taylor. I mean, all day, every day. Ahmaud Aubrey, all day, every day, all day, every day. All day, every day. It's sad. It's really sad. It's, it's really not sad. like we don't see that, it. We've got the videos. You know, we see it. And then there's still no I, accountability. I do want to talk about one thing if we have some more time. And I would love to talk about it. something else because I'm so shy. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't hold back, Phil. Naomi. I, I just, I, I'm running out of things to say, obviously. Um, I watched Naomi the other day. And there's this whole controversy about fashion and fashion being inclusive or being segregational and keeping people out and it doesn't appeal to everybody and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, how dare they not have everybody in their advertising and I'm a plus size model and Dior doesn't do anything for me and I'm black and Chanel doesn't do anything for me. And yes, because they don't care. Chanel was not, Gabrielle Chanel did not create her collections for everybody in the world to wear them. That was not her intention. It's not her business plan or business model. That's not what she's interested in. She wanted certain women 
of a certain means to be able to wear them. And Dior is not created for everyone to wear. Uh, high fashion couture, that's not what it's about. So it was never created for you. So I don't know what everyone is complaining about because everything isn't for everybody. You know, that's part of the thing of the world. I can't sing, but Whitney Houston can sing. She gets to sing. Right. I don't hate on Whitney because I can't sing. I don't hate on the music business because they haven't given me the contract that I deserve. I don't go around saying the music industry sucks because they don't hire me to do an album even though I can't sing. Even though I'm a size 12, they don't hire me to be a couture model. Well, because it's not designed for that. It's not what it's about. And, and when a designer, you know, again, I support inclusivity all my life, all my career. As I said, I'm the first editor at Vibe Magazine. In my day, I might as well have been black in the 80s modeling because what I looked like was just still so different from what everybody else was. I was different. They didn't know where to cast me. You're not black and you're not white. Really, what do we do with you? At least we have the token black person that we put in there. But when you're somewhere in the middle, we don't have a token middle person. Yeah, I don't think we <laughs> so need that. I, I check check, really check human point. resources. Exactly. I think it's a, a very important point for people to realize when you are bitching about fashion not being inclusive to realize that that's okay. It was not created for you. Everything on the planet is not for everyone. And that's the problem with the democratization of all these businesses, I, I, as someone who loves fashion, who loves legend, who loves uh, people of all colors, I just don't see color necessarily, or I see it, I definitely see it, but I see it all as beauty. So the color doesn't matter whether I think it's beautiful or not, although some colors are more beautiful. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's very interesting. I, 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 and I just, I'm so sick of listening to people complain about fashion and you know, there's certain big editors that were at Vogue for years, and now they're complaining about how they were treated and blah, blah, blah. And now I know. I didn't see them bringing anybody with them on their coattails. <laughs> I, didn't see, I didn't see them rising any, raising anybody else up. They had everybody following behind them when they got to that door where they said, do you have a seat for the front row? They said, yes, I'm right here. And they said, do you have anybody with you? And they went, Nope, nobody with me, just me in that seat next to Anna Winter. No surprise. Let's be really, really clear. Let's be really, 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 really clear. You know, I mean, I think that it's very in fashion to complain now and to say how racist everybody is and how horrible everybody is. I have not met one victim in all my years in fashion entertainment. There's a lot of volunteers, but not a lot of victims. <laughs> A lot of people volunteered. I didn't hear that person complaining at all for the last 40 years when they had these extraordinary expense accounts and they were fabulous. But suddenly when the, their time was up and one should go graciously as I did when I felt my time was up, go before your time. My advice to that person is girl, go before your time is up and do something else, build something bigger and better. I moved on and moved on and moved on and moved on. Sour grapes is terrible when shared with others. It just doesn't taste good and it's bad taste. So I, I, I think a lot of the complaining comes from a lack of history and a lack of understanding. And not that history is right, but I think a lot of history has been very wrong and unfair. But I don't know if anybody has told everybody, but the world is not fair, you know. <laughs> I don't know who promised anybody a fair ride in this circus, but I was never promised a fair ride, didn't get one, and I'm glad I got what I got and I made the most of it. Make a dollar out of 15 cents and make your own lane, but stop complaining that Chanel doesn't have you in their show and fashion doesn't recognize me. That's okay. That's okay, fashion doesn't recognize you. I, I, I think it's so interesting as working with the NFL and working with a lot of sports people over the years. I'm like, y'all are still playing for the NFL? Do they still own that plantation? <laughs> are you still showing up there? I mean, like, 
<laughs> you hear what he Mark said? Johnson or Diddy or any of these people don't uh, start their own leagues together. Come on now. Imagine if all the black and Latin players decided not to show up on a Sunday of football season. That would be a really interesting game, wouldn't that? Imagine if they didn't show up for two weeks, three weeks. Imagine if they didn't come for the Monday night game. Shit would change, wouldn't it? Yeah. I'm very, very, it takes, I walked away in the peak of my career and I decided long ago never to walk in anyone's shadow. If I should fail, if I succeed, at least I live as I believe. No matter what they take from me, they cannot take away my dignity. And I say hallelujah, because can anybody on the NFL say that? I don't think so. Colin Kaepernick can. Colin Kaepernick He's can kneeling. sit with me <laughs> all alone right here. <laughs> Just Colin and me. Maybe Denzel will come over too. Um, oh. But, oh, I love me some Denzel. But, you know, I mean, I, seriously, I, I just think all the complaining and all the complaining is, it is what it is. That's what it is. Make your own. Do your own for your own thing. Like, don't complain about Chanel or, or whoever you're complaining about. You know, now, if you want to complain about Zara or H&M or Kmart not using people of all colors and sizes, well, then I think you should complain and I'd be right there with you because... That's who their market is. Chanel, Louis Vuitton, Gucci was not created and never was. I promise you, Gabrielle, Chanel rolls over in her grave every day when she sees certain people wearing her sunglasses, <laughs> spraying that perfume on. She probably wanted them all to spray the perfume on. That yeah. was the thing that was made for everybody. So you can have a little bit of it. It could be a little, a little bit taste. Like a, a little taste of luxury. But that was another thing. Past generations, we were aspirational. Here's a good one. We were aspirational. We wanted to, to, to achieve. So we could look at a picture of Cindy Crawford or Helena Christensen on a desert or somewhere in a white gown and think, oh my God, I want to be in a desert where it's 200 degrees and there's no people and I want to be in that white gown. I don't know what fun that would possibly be. But we looked at it and thought, oh my God, look how gorgeous that is. That's where I want to be. And we said, I want to be there. And we loved it. And we set our goals to work hard so we look like that. These kids now, like, they don't like that. If they're, if, they, if it's not for them, they don't want to work for it. Then they hate on it because, well, they're not casting me. I'm going to cancel their culture. I didn't cancel anyone's culture. I worked very hard to have my composites. So I was accepted into the business. I created a space. I went to who would understand me. And I know there is a place because I created the place in 1980 for you. There is a space for you. Kara created the space for you in a few years later than 1980. She's a couple of years younger than me. Kara's so 27 now. There. The space is there. You can't say the space isn't there. The, the space was created. I was shorter, I was different. Um, you know, there is the conversation of there are, there can only be one at the table, and I, I agree, unfortunately. But the table is bigger now. The pie is bigger now. There is a space. We have the ability to create your own. You have the Internet. You Everybody has their own TV show. Everybody has a sewing machine. Everybody can hire people in some other country to sew your products. So you can take advantage of indigenous people somewhere also. Have your own sweatshop. You can, can take advantage of people somewhere else. That don't you can oppress them. someone somewhere. Don't give up. Yes, don't give up. You can be an oppressor. <laughs> <laughs> you can be a predator and oppressor. This is America. America. I mean, God bless America. I mean, seriously, though, I, I, I make joke, but it's, it's, it is serious and it is true. The sour grapes, and I've got plenty of them to press. You know, I mean, uh, I can tell <laughs> you have little stories where we could laugh and laugh and laugh about people and their bullshit. But the reality is fashion was not created for everybody. It is not a democracy. Fashion, real fashion is not. That's why models are size two and they look a certain way. And lastly on that thing, because I heard Naomi complaining about this and I think it's extremely important. There's a lot on that I could talk about for that. I won't get into all that. But lastly, a designer has a vision and he goes to the Galapagos Islands and he sees pink flamingos and he says, oh my God, that's what my collection is about, pink flamingos. And there's no redheads and Asians in the Galapagos Islands. 
so he doesn't put redheads and gl- and Asians in his runway show because that's what the theme of his creative runway show is because that's what his creative vision is. If his creative vision is racist, his creative vision is racist. Then don't buy his show. Don't buy his dresses from the Galapagos Islands. But good Lord, let the idiot do his Galapagos Islands collection if he wants and let him be creative and stop telling everybody what they got to do. Exactly. Make a FUBU for us, for us, by us. Do your own. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Cross colors. Yeah, it's coming back. Awesome. Tell people where to go that's most important for you. You have your hell. website. We're there. No. <laughs> go to hell. <laughs> Make reservations. Um, your uh, website, uh, social media. I'm sorry? Your website, social media, oh, anything? philiplock.com. You know, it's just all philiplock, P-H-I-L-L-I-P-B-L-O-C-H on Instagram. Um, I'm a big Instagrammer. I like my Instagram. I, I The stuff goes on to YouTube, and I like YouTube. I'm a major YouTube. People never die. Whitney is still alive. I turn on Whitney. Here's Whitney Houston's my 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 thing, and um, I I've been all over the world with Whitney since she died. Whitney and I have been to Russia. We've been to Africa. Like YouTube, no one ever dies. The music lives. The live versions live on. It is just the most magnificent thing ever. Bonnie Pointer passed away the other day and uh, heaven must have sent you and I posted a great picture and I thought of that moment when I used to dance to that song and that was my jam. I cried too many endless night, you know. And there's a video of her singing that song in the peak of her life, in her biggest moment ever. And that's how we see Bonnie Pointer forever in that minute and 30 seconds or that three minute and 23 seconds video of that song performing on soul train in the best moment of her life youtube is a gift from god it it can stop you in your greatest moment ever and freeze you in that moment forever you bonnie pointer will never be 60 or 70 however old she was when she died she's always going to be 32 and I cried to Manny in that sequin outfit. Like, Donna Summer is always going to be that age, and Whitney is never going to be older than 47. And yet she's always 30 and in South Africa singing. It, YouTube is the most amazing gift since those magazine covers on The Sin. The legacy continues. The legacy continues, and YouTube is a form of legacy. And and, and Instagram is where all our, our past and all our dreams and all our future lies. It's it's fascinating what the times we live in. So yes, there's a lot of hope. Okay. Who do you think should play me in a movie? <sighs> Be Denzel, right? You could say it. Oh, it's definitely Denzel. If he's busy. Someone has to have the looks, but has to have the depth. That's the problem. Someone who really can go into the character. I don't know if Denzel has the depth, really. Because like Joaquin does I not look Denzel. like you. Wait, I, have to, I have to tell a great story. I don't know why I'm on a Denzel kick today, but when 9-11 happened, I was in New York. It was Fashion Week. And we were all trapped in New York. We couldn't get on planes. Everything shut down. And I had a very good friend that was friends with Denzel, and Denzel was in New York because I think there was a Victoria Secret fashion show about to happen the next day, if I'm not mistaken, or the day after, whatever. So everybody was in town, and Denzel flew me home on his private plane through uh, from from New York because I gave my ticket to another friend who had children back in, in L.A., so I gave her my... I had a ticket to leave, like, on the Wednesday or Thursday, and... Uh, she took my ticket and and i had no way to get home so i was so oh, stuck so in nice and though that's so my friend nice told Denzel, that. she said oh i have this friend philip and he's stuck in new york is there room on the private plane and he was like yeah and so to this day denzel's my man he flew me home. very cool move denzel. i was hoping that plane would go down could you imagine the, the story denzel yep. and philip Locke die in private plane crash Fiery, that passionate hater. plane crash. He did plane crash. It would have been phenomenal. 
the le- the rumors would have gone on forever. <laughs> never stop. Never stop. Never stop. It would have been perfect. I'd still have been hope. <laughs> <laughs> it's not too late. There's still Jets. There's still you, and there's still Denzel. Well, yes. I can't wait to see those comp cards, which are like the magazines of the Sen. They're, oh, tomorrow! They're... Tomorrow is the big day. Tomorrow's the big one. Tomorrow's my birthday, actually. So tomorrow's tomorrow. There's a good one. There's well, covers and comp cards tomorrow. Okay, because I was going to ask for that stuff. That's incredible. Um, I'm just going to say, Princess Diana, 1982. Who was on the covers of all the magazines? I'm just saying. It wasn't just Princess Diana. Just a hint to tomorrow's Instagram. <laughs> wow. I didn't even know I would be on the on the Zoom thing with the guy who was the, the cover master back then. Yeah, well, listen, yeah. You it are was beyond only, oh, fun. Boy. It was only, oh boy, it wasn't Vogue. But they're good covers. They're funny. You'll see. You'll have a laugh. They're covers. It's not TV yes. Guide. I mean, it's they're covers. That is really something in your life. That is really something to walk up to a magazine stand I tell you, I tell you, the being famous on TV, <laughs> the failed singing career, <laughs> the books, the QVC, the NFL, the beauty badges, all that stuff, amazing, amazing, but the Ken doll, but the modeling days, that's right here. That's right here. Nothing like that. Well, thank God you got to experience that and you have those uh, permanent mementos that do not age. Yes, yes, and forever. That's where I'm. I'm only posting those for a reason. <laughs> that's, that's right. Where you go when I die? Forever twenty one and on the cover of Oh Boy. <laughs> well, don't have a birthday breakdown like I always do every year. If you could say yeah. your name and that they're watching Chance TV, that would be amazing. What's up? I'm Philip Locke, and thanks for taking a chance. You're watching Chance TV. All right, I'm going to kill the 